Hello everyone and welcome to Being a Manager Leader in a VUCA World, a short course presented by IT Masters and Charles Sturt University. My name is Guy Coward and I'll be your MC for this webinar and for the duration of the course. Your mentor is Kath Attery. Before we begin, some housekeeping. All webinars for this course will be held at 7.30pm Australian Eastern Daylight Time, with recordings made for those of you who cannot attend on a given night. If you can make it, we hope you'll attend the webinars live and contribute to a, a collaborative learning environment. We encourage the asking of questions and the use of chat during the webinars, and we ask that you direct all questions relevant to course content to the Q&A section, and that you send all administration type questions, you know, questions about dates, resource availability, times, those sorts of things, to the support team in chat. You can chat with staff only, or to all of your fellow students. Um, I ask that you, you make sure you send it to everyone just to keep everyone in the loop. Uh, you can make the choice by toggling through the drop down box once you open the chat log. There are usually some very experienced industry based attendees who'll be really helpful with any queries you might have and can often augment the, uh, the content. We'll also have Q&A sessions periodically and if a question is particularly relevant, I'll, I'll interrupt during the, the discussion and, and, and put it to Kath. Just a quick overview of IT Masters. We're a training organisation that exists as partner to Charles Sturt University, uh, who we work with to deliver a number of their master's courses. We also market the courses that we work on uh, on Charles Sturt's behalf and hope that the best way to do that is, is give some, more, some of it away free, like tonight. If we all do a good enough job, then students will be encouraged to enrol in the full master's or a grad cert if it suits them. With that said, we hope this course stands alone in its own right and is its own reward. Uh, we want you to learn some useful information, to have a bit of fun, hopefully make you know some connections with some of your fellow students. There's over 2,000 of you out there uh, who have enrolled in the course, so you're a bit spoiled for choice. Um, yeah, and, and, and you know, it, it, I really do think that you know these are a really valuable tool. Chantelle and Hannah are here tonight in a, an administrative and technical support role for IT Masters. They're also responsible for the the course page uh, learn.itmasters.edu.au which is where you'll find all the other materials needed for this course, links to readings and discussion forums and the, the, the quizzes that we have, as well as the exam at the end. If you have any questions uh, tonight or later on about you know, the, the course page itself, feel free to contact us using the details on that page or, or chuck something in the chat and we'll be able to talk you through it. Next week, we'll talk a bit more about CSU and the, the course that this short course is a part of. Kath's a, an expert on that. And that'll give you an idea of, you know, what studying with CSU is all about and how these short courses can help. Uh, so if you have any questions about that, maybe just hold them over and we'll answer them then. Kath's credentials are on the screen. She's MBA course director, uh, holds innumerable postgrads awards, and I'm very excited to be working with you, Kath. It's, it's nice to have met you. Uh, can everyone please welcome Kath? Thank you, Guy, and thanks everybody for coming along on a Thursday evening or whatever time it is in your part of the world. So um, Guy's already given me a bit of an introduction. So I look after a number of courses at Charles Sturt University, one of them being the MBA and the others um, mainly a suite of courses in the area of human resource management. Um, so this course, being a manager leader in a VUCA world, is part of our, the first subject of our master's degree, which is um, in GT501, sorry, of our MBA. It's the first subject of our MBA. Um, the subject's MGT501, Contemporary Management. Um, so we're gonna do four weeks of what would normally be a 12-week subject, and um, it'll just give you a taster of what it's like to do an MBA. Um, so this week's topic is the VUCA world and its great big challenges. So in this week, I'm just going to be setting the scene and um, you giving you a picture of what is the VUCA world and what are the things that managers, leaders have to contend with in that environment. And I always like to start off with a bit of a Dilbert cartoon because um, I think Dilbert really brings management down to sort of something human for me. Um, so I love this little quote here. Um, and it really just illustrates that for every challenge, there's an opportunity. And um, 
you know, in complexity and uh, volatility and transformational change. Obviously, sometimes it's very painful, but sometimes it can, some really great things can come out of it. And there's a couple of sort of examples that I think could be uh, illustrative of that. So years ago, um, when supermarkets first started coming in to, you know, areas, so we're talking 50 years ago or more, um, a lot of small businesses were really impacted by that. And my uncle was a butcher in the UK and he had a, his own butcher's business and eventually had to close it because um, he you know couldn't keep up with the supermarkets so he closed his butcher shop and he got a job at Sainsbury's and he said I wish I'd done it sooner um, it was so nice of him to be able to just work nine to five or whatever the hours were have a guaranteed income just have a set duties so you know sometimes change isn't bad and change can actually bring you a better life um, but sometimes it can be very challenging all right, um, so I'll just talk briefly about this, um, only two slides, um, and then next week we'll, after the uh, webinar, we'll stay back, uh, Guy and myself and maybe a couple of others. And if anybody does want to ask about studying a master's uh, at Charles Sturt, then I'm happy to talk about that then. Um, I just wanna highlight that there's two, basically there's two pathways to the master's. So first is, um, on, and an MBA in particular is that you would have a bachelor degree and then uh, a set amount of industry experience and you would be admitted into our masters and it's a 12 subject program. Um, but these days not everybody that comes into the masters already has a uh, bachelor degree. And so what we generally say is if you have some post-secondary qualifications, so some post high school qualifications combined with, I mean, most of you would probably have a solid 10 years or more uh, industry experience, but what we're looking at is the last five years where you've got some team leader experience, some discretionary decision-making experience, some judgment, some planning, that sort of thing. So we wanna see that you are moving into a more of a supervisory senior level. Um, and then that would be, uh, what we'd look at that in combination, the two of those, and generally uh, that would grant you entry into what's called a graduate certificate. And at Charles Sturt University, we take you into the graduate certificate. And if you like, that's a test to see if you are able to cope at um, postgraduate level at university. And so you do the four subjects of the graduate certificate. And if you pass all four of those, you can move on to the masters. And the good news is you take those four subjects with you. So you actually then just complete the final eight subjects to get the MBA or other master's qualification. Um, and just briefly, what it looks like at Charles Sturt University, if, you look, if you're looking at MBA, um, the four, first four subjects are contemporary management, marketing management, um, accounting and financial management, and business strategy. And that's fairly standard that an MBA would have that broad-based general management um, subjects. Um, from there, we actually give you a bit of flexibility. Some universities will require you to do economics and finance um, and certain other subjects. We actually think that it's up to you. So if you're actually working in uh, banking or finance sector, you probably don't need to do a basic finance subject. So you'd be much better off choosing subjects that are going to extend your knowledge, not repeat it. So we do give you a bit of flexibility in the, what we call the restricted electives. And then lastly, you can finish off with a specialization or not, it's just up to you. We do have specializations in accounting and finance, business analysis, educational leadership, entrepreneurship and leadership, human resource management, IT, leadership, project management, which where we offer four subjects that are delivered through IT masters as part of the project management specialization. Then there's marketing, public sector management and social impact. So that's a really brief synopsis. I won't um, go into it any further. If you're interested, you can uh, get in touch with us or you can stay behind next uh, week after the webinar to ask questions. And um, you know, uh, the admin team will also field any questions regarding the course to me um, as we go along. All right, so I'm going to start off with um, this uh, slide, which is about uh, the VUCA worlds. So let's talk about what is VUCA. Um, this week, as I mentioned, we're going to set the scene and talk about what are the great big challenges that uh, people are facing in the uh, business environment now. So VUCA stands for Volatility, 
uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. And it was a term first coined by the US military at the end of the Cold War. So that makes it about 50 years old now, which is interesting that even then they were looking at this change as being something really complex and difficult to deal with. Um, but in our world, in the business world, outside of uh, the US military, it really gained traction in the early 2000s because that's when things really did start to speed up. So volatility is due, that's about the speed of change in an industry or a market or the world in general. And the more volatile the world is, the more faster things change and the harder it is as managers and leaders to plan and respond to those changes. And then uncertainty refers to the extent to which we can confidently predict the future. So in a truly uncertain environment, you, it's really hard to predict. Um, so you don't really know what you're going to do and whether what you're proposing will, be work, will work. So the more uncertain the world, the harder it is to predict. Complexity refers to the number of factors that we need to take into account. So in the old days in Australia, we might just have to worry about the Australian economy and what's happening with the population and trends in the Australian market. But nowadays we have to uh, think about all of the other impacts that are um, that are relevant to our organisation. So it could be that things that are happening in China might impact us, or it could be that um, uh, you know, the technology is really changing. So uh, increasingly organisations and their environments that they face are becoming more and more complex, highly complex. And so it's hard to then analyse all of the uh, particular scenarios that you may face when you're planning. And lastly, ambiguity, and that really refers to the lack of clarity about how to interpret something. So if a situation is ambiguous, uh, then the information is incomplete, or it might be contradictory, or it might be too inaccurate to draw conclusions. Um, so this is the world now, and this, in some ways there's all been, always been instances of this, but I think what we're say, seeing is more and more, this is the um, environment that people are, um, Facing. So disruption and volatility have occurred in the past. The Industrial Revolution was a huge period of um, disruption in human history. Um, but what used to occur after periods of disruption was periods of relative stability. And so what we're seeing now is that organisations are facing a number of great big challenges and the ability of, of managers to plan, organise, lead and control, which is their main functions, um, is becoming harder and harder. So um, I'm going to take you through those great big challenges, but we might just pause and um, ask our poll question, Guy. Okie dokie, I'll put that on now. Uh, poll one is on transformational change. Have you been involved in the transformational change process in the workforce? I'll launch that poll now. We've got yes, no, and unsure, just in case. And you should all be able to see that just on your screens. Oh, wow. I know, it's amazing, isn't it? Overwhelmingly, yeah. <laughs> Overwhelming. <laughs> And yeah, and that's it. We're all facing constant change and we feel like we've got change fatigue and, um, and but it's not gonna go away. Um, and so I suppose the thing is that we have to really think about, okay, what can we do? How can we cope with this? And, and knowing a little bit about it, I think helps as well. All right. Um, so I probably should have just mentioned with the management, um, a manager, we're going to talk about what is a leader, what is a manager in our next topic next week. But just to go back to that, I think um, it's probably worthwhile to highlight that the general consensus among management theories is that there are four main functions of management. So planning, which is about uh, you know, direction, aims, objective, vision, vision, mission, strategy, operational plans. And then organising, which is about, you know, what organisational structure do you have? Um, how do you allocate resources? What information systems are there within the organisational management, knowledge management systems? How is change management organised and structured? And then there's leading, which is about motivating, rewarding, managing teams, communicating. And so communicating the vision, the direction and all of that. And the last is controlling, which is about monitoring the operations, maintaining quality, monitoring performance, that sort of area. So VUCA, you know, managing and 
performing all those functions of a manager, planning, organising, leading and controlling is incredibly challenging in the VUCA world. So we're going to now move on and look at some of the great big challenges facing uh, people in the VUCA world. And remembering just this week, we're just setting the scene. So um, I love this quote because it's just really indicative of the fact that we've always lived in a globalised world. And so Socrates, you know, this quote comes from him that, you know, I'm a citizen of the, not of Athens or Greece, but of the world. And he said that in 470 BC. So if he said that, what, two and a half thousand years ago, how much more so are you a citizen of the world now when we've got, you know, internet and Facebook and, and aeroplanes and transportation and um, everything. So I think it's, it's, it's always amazes me when I see that quote. So in terms of globalization, that is probably a, an enormous challenge that is uh, organizations face and it affects every organization whether they have uh, a presence overseas or not um, and I think um, it's something globalization is something a term that's sometimes usually loosely used but what we're talking about it in this context is has two sides, the globalisation of production and the globalisation of markets. And so I'm going to start off with the globalisation of production. This slide is actually from 2002. So it's nearly 20 years ago um, that this slide was produced. And there's a whole range of papers on this um, top of the Tricteria. Um, when that, uh, I guess, theorists wanted to illustrate the impact of globalisation. So you can see with this uh, particular slide that this um, little toy has plastic eyes from China and then his body is from Malaysia, his coat's from Korea, um, the legs are again from China and the legs from, uh, and then the plastic for the legs is from Taiwan and so on. We've got the verse recognition system from San Francisco, uh, the, sorry, the recognition requirements from San Francisco, the recognition programming from Taiwan. So this Amazing toys, a combination of all this technology and parts that are brought together and, and probably assembled in somewhere like China and then shipped all over the world. And that, whatever your business is, you're going to have um, supplies that are coming like that from all over the world, whether it's paper or stationery, um, or whether it's components in a manufacturing um, business. What you're wearing, if you think about what you're wearing today, the clothes you're wearing, um, where were they made? And if they're cotton and they were made somewhere like Sri Lanka, where was the cotton grown? Maybe it was grown in Australia. Um, where was that cotton then made into material? Um, so where was the design for your particular item made? So you can see how like how incredibly integrated we are in the world. But what happens obviously is that that integration has challenges as well. So um, the global supply chain being so interconnected, if something disrupts the global supply chain, then it can have significant impacts on business operations and on planning and your ability to manage and, and deliver and all of those sort of things. Um, and so an example of that happened when uh, the Japanese uh, tsunami occurred in 2011. And so um, there was about, Japan makes about 22% of um, the world's 300 millimeter silicon wafers. Um, and they came from uh, a particular plant in Fukushima prefecture. And then 60% of critical auto parts for the world were in the same area. So you can imagine the impact of that um, disaster on uh, both the, uh, I guess the computer industry and the auto industry. So you can see that uh, globalization of production and the fact that we're so enmeshed in the global world has a huge impact on organizations. So I'm going to move on now and talk about the globalization of markets. Um, so this, I think this visual gives you a really good idea of um, globalization of markets. So here's IKEA, clearly in I'm assuming that these are actually Chinese characters. Um, so in China somewhere. So you've got a Swedish uh, retail outlet in China, um, but also there's the online uh, shop where you can actually go and shop 
with um, for IKEA. So, so the globalizations of markets have arisen because of significant improvements in both technology and transportation. Um, so if we start with transportation, containerization and um, super freighters have meant that goods can be shipped all over the world relatively cheaply and within a reasonable time frame. Even with jet transport now, um, it, the cost of uh, shipping is significantly lower. Um, but also in terms of doing business all over the world, jet transportation obviously and jet travel gives, has shrunk the globe. So we can uh, do business much easier in a variety of countries around the world. But the impact of uh, the cost and the improvements in technology are what are the most significant. So I love this example in the, between 1930 and 1990, the cost of a phone call between, the, uh, between New York and London fell from $244 a minute to $3.30 a minute. So in 1930, it was equivalent to $244 a minute. In 1990, it was $3.30 a minute. But obviously now that cost is irrelevant because we have Facebook, we have Skype, we have Zoom, we have a numerous number of ways to connect between those two cities. So that cost has uh, fallen significantly and the ease of connection is so much more. Um, so digital technologies, um, that impact on organisations, companies, governments, it is really significant and it doesn't just affect retail. Um, while I put up the example of retail, um, you, you see the impact of this transformation in digital technologies on a huge range of um, industries. So legal companies can outsource some of their kind of hack, low level hack legal work to places like India or um, oh, some places like Malaysia or uh, any Commonwealth country that has the same legal basis as Australia, um, we could outsource that um, hack legal work to there. And because of the different timeframes that could be done, you know, while after we've gone home for the evening and then it will be ready for the lawyers for the next morning. Um, same with things like, um, uh, pathology, microbiology, radiology, reading MRIs, any of that could be outsourced as well. So no industry is actually immune to the impact of the globalisation of markets and the change in technology um, that has, has arisen in, the recent, in recent times. So obviously that has a significant impact on managers and leaders and how you operate. It raises questions, moral and ethical dilemmas around where you locate your staff, um, what, what services are retained in country, what services are sent elsewhere, and a whole host of um, other uh, questions that arise. Um, I might start, stop here for a moment, uh, Guy, and see if there are any questions from the students. Yeah, the there's a couple. Uh, DNA, DS Lenovo PC has asked management of bushfire in Australia and the enormous loss of wildlife and all of the other externalities, I guess, uh, show that VUCA is of no importance to the bureaucracy. Do, would you have any comments on that or do you think that's uh, a good statement? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's such a emotive um, issue. Um, I think what uh, so number one, the bushfires is an example of VUCA happening because um, this is something that's happened that's transformational and, uh, and, you know, ambiguous and volatile and uncertain because we, and complex because we don't know how to handle that, this. And we haven't got good policy um, and we haven't got good structures in place and everybody's scrambling. Um, and a friend of mine just posted because he is a, um, a president of a, um, a, a local museum and um, he's, it's a volunteer organization and that 
because it isn't an organisation, because it's a not-for-profit, because it's not um, money-making, it kind of falls in the gaps. It was severely hit by the bushfires with some infrastructure damage and it's extremely challenging and he's finding it incredibly hard to navigate the processes. So, yeah, I mean, I think the bushfires, and thanks for raising that, I will talk about that as we go through as well. Um, it is an enormous challenge in Australia and the whole issue around sustainability, which I'm going to get to, is a massive um, issue for managers and leaders in the modern world. So, Guy, another we, question? All righty, we will go for another one from Richard this time. When starting up a business from scratch, uh, in what ways are invoices managed? Are money, and, money or goods from the supplier sent first? Is that within the scope of this? Or, or, <laughs> and, and I guess... I guess uh, I think you need uh, to ask an accountant. Yeah, uh, but, but we, we can maybe tailor the question. We can say, well, if, if you're starting up something, uh, is, is there any, like, is it important to keep in mind, VUCA things? Is there anything you can sort of do to prepare for it? Yeah, I think the thing about, like, the VUCA aspect of that is, um, because I'm, um, I do a little bit of, uh, I guess, research into um, sort of startups and, um, and uh, micro businesses, is that, with technology, they're actually really good um, ways of um, getting payments now for micro businesses. So obviously, PowerPal is one, but you know, if you think about markets and small storeholders, there's lots of little um, apps or different um, ways that they can actually get payments at um, places like that. I would just do a bit of a search um, online about. Um, micro business payment systems and invoicing and you may find some different types of um, products that are could be use, really useful for you. All right, um, let's get going. We'll have another poll shortly folks. So get your voting question, uh, your voting fingers ready. Okay, so I'm going to move on. Um, so then, so the first of these great big challenges in the VUCA world was, um, is globalization. And then I've kind of alluded to this as well already, but the second is digital innovation. And um, it's often uh, called now that, or say, stated now that we're in the fourth industrial revolution. So the first industrial revolution was the one um, that came with the harnessing of steam power and then with say Fordism and the factory and the assembly line and then with the rise of computer and internet um, uh, technology and nuclear energy. But now we're in something that's much more integrated. So what we're seeing is this integration of things like cloud computing, mobile devices, internet of things, um, uh, advanced human machine interfaces, um, 3D printing, smart center, sensors, uh, big data analytics. So it's enormous and it just is a huge challenge for organisations. Um, I think that, um, you know, all of those things like AI, machine learning, coding, robotic sensors, cloud, com cloud computing, nanotechnology, they all put challenges out there. What do we go with? How do we use it? What's worthwhile to um, adopt? Uh, are we adopting quick enough? Are we being left behind? So what we do see is that, and that what can be fr quite frightening is that um, some of these technological innovations can have quite rapid and pervasive impacts. And um, uh, so firms who don't act can sometimes find that they've been left behind. And then there are also, um, you know, radical changes to business models that are also upending old structures. So things like Uber, Netflix, which are uh, use technology, but new business models, which really make have made a difference, to, you know, and up uh, disrupted, say, the, uh, the entertainment industry and TV and, you know, films and all of that broad entertainment industry or the taxi industry and, of course, Airbnb with the um, hotel industry. So the thing about, I think, uh, with this disruption, it works if the solution is elegant, simple for the customer, but solves numerous needs for them. So with mobile phones, obviously, they're so useful because they combine, you know, camera banking, everything you need in one particular um, 
you know, a little gadget, whereas before we used to have to take everything separately with us. So um, I think that this whole fourth industrial revolution is a real challenge. Um, how we use analytics is also a real challenge, but there's great um, steps in this. Um, and there are some really innovative things happening in data and data analytics. And we've got a team of people, um, some of you may have been attending the uh, other MOOC that was run by uh, IT Masters on um, data mining, and that was run by a couple of my colleagues in the School of Computing and uh, Math. And they do great stuff on using data analytics to be able to hone in on things like health aspects, so to be able to identify predictions as to which people are more likely to develop Alzheimer's or, you know, how, what sort of things might be needed uh, to be implemented for water storage. There's a whole range of great um, usages of uh, data analytics and it can really improve our service delivery. So I think that's obviously an area where organisations should probably try and invest in, and um, direct some of their energies. And so futuristic examples of how the you know, whole connection of this um, uh, fourth industrial revolution and how it might play out. Um, I've got this little anecdote. So it's a, a, world, <laughs> a world where your toilet bowl tells your fridge that your cholesterol is too high. Your fridge in turn adjusts your shopping order for dairy products that week, which are delivered to you by an automatic vehicle or a drone from a grocery warehouse. But it also sends an alert to your healthcare um, AI, which data which whose database monitors your cardiovascular system. And that AI in turn liaises with your home hub chatbot facility, which tells you to stop eating so many high fat items and make better use of your gym subscription. So that's the kind of futuristic type application of all of these sort of things. Um, but we're not there yet. Um, in some places Thank we've goodness. made <laughs> Great strides, um, but we haven't really got all the way there. Yeah, I must say, Guy, I'm not really going to get my fridge to do my <laughs> shopping for me. <laughs> um, so I think the thing about it is that you can see that innovation has actually had an impact on businesses in the uh, global marketplace and that some business models have become very powerful. And so Amazon, Uber, you know, Airbnb, they're really illustrative of uh, some of these changes. Okay, should I, um, oh yeah, I was just gonna say, can anybody else think of any other sort of examples of things that are happening in their workplace in the, um, you know, in relation to any of these activities um, that we see as components of the fourth industrial revolution? Yeah, we've got some stuff from the chat. Leonie's mm -hmm. talked about after pay and zip pay as an example. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. MOOCs. Uh, <laughs> Mix, they are disruptors. <laughs> they are. Yeah, it's, it's. I can't think of anything that really isn't. No. Okay, so I think we had a poll here, didn't we, um, Guy? Yeah, I'll just pull that one up. Poll number two. So for this one, uh, it was sort of which sector are you working in now? And I just took a, a, a standard list and, and chucked it in there, so it might not be too, too useful, but. I did my best. Uh, which sector do you toil away in? And I've just got a few there, all of the, the major ones you can think of. Oh, apologies right. if yours okay. isn't listed. A lot of IT people, so I'm probably telling people, I'm telling my grandmother to suck eggs. I think. <laughs> I'm teaching my grandmother to suck eggs. <laughs> okay. Yeah, most of the people we have on our sort of list of people like that we talk about these short courses to our IT, of course, because of the courses IT Masters runs. But yeah, um, it's really good to get other people as well. Um, really broadens the discussion, so that's good. And well, you people are actually like incredibly it. important for our future. Mm. Um, yes. Driving the change. Yep, driving the change. Okay, all right. Okay, so I just, I'll, I've grabbed a lot of these, um, like, uh, what do you call, headlines in 2016. You can actually see that 2015 and 2016. And I was looking at it today thinking, oh, mm, that's quite interesting. So I went back to see um, what five technologies would disrupt healthcare by 2020. And um, uh, some of them were kind of predicting the scenario that I just put forward. And 
I can say that, well, we may be there in some instances, we're not completely there and it's not pervasive. Um, so I was a little bit pleased to see that some of the predictions weren't actually, hadn't come to fruition. Um, but some of them are really good. Um, obviously things like Alzheimer's with um, home care, you know, if you've got the facility to manage people um, who are at risk of say, you know, potentially harming themselves or getting themselves in a situation where it could be dangerous. I think, you know, those sort of systems uh, can be very useful. Um, but obviously there's that sort of ethical gray line about what extent do we go with any of our technologies. Um, so digital disruption, it does impact on most industries. Um, uh, we see it uh, through all of these areas like social, sophisticated customers asking more, cloud computer, data explosion, rise of mobile, um, you know, the blockchain whole thing, which I really don't understand how it works. Um, so, you know, things are changing. I think that's really um, evident when you look at headlines in the marketplace. Um, but some of these can be really useful. So for example, some of the technologies that uh, banks are employing now uh, have been very useful in managing things like financial crime and money laundering. Um, uh, so in other areas, uh, maybe not so useful. Um, but so the impact on management is that management is no longer about co coordinating business at usual, as usual. It's about, I think, what it's really clear is that managers should be thinking about leading innovation, creating the climate and conditions and the culture to enable change and innovation in your organisation. Um, looking at ways to add value, uh, looking for opportunities to capitalise on. Um, and that firms really need to have a culture that encourages innovation and doesn't punish employees for failed projects. I think that's really critical for organisations to do well. Um, and so what we have is entrepreneurship and intrapreneurship. And so associated with um, say disruption and innovation, obviously the next big challenge is um, entrepreneurship. So businesses need to look at ways of doing things, foster a culture of innovation, increase acceptance of risk, diversify their business models, look for new segments, um, you know, harness. So, you know, I think that obviously fostering entrepreneurship in the organ, in the workplace and looking for ways to encourage this new ideas, encouraging employees to put forward um, new approaches is, is really something that's imperative for organisations today. Um, this was again just some screen grabs about what's going on. So um, a few years ago when we still had Malcolm Turnbull in government, you know, the whole uh, national innovation and science agenda was born and so we were in the ideas boom and there'd never been a more exciting time to be Australian. I think post bushfires, um, it's probably a, a different narrative that we're facing, but you know, the whole focus was on startup and entrepreneurs, universities investing in um, incubators, um, getting investors on board, seed money into new businesses, all that sort of uh, area. And we saw all these new startup incubators happening and occurring in Sydney and in places like major regional towns and so at um, Charles Sturt University of course we've got a number of incubators we've got an ag tech incubator in Wagga Wagga and then we've got Send West Innovate here in Bathurst and so you see that happening a lot so there's a whole sort of I guess move within Australia to try and foster these new ideas and think about ways to develop and improve and look for new opportunities and keep Australia clever um, and so obviously businesses need to come on board with that. Okay, so the next um, slide is just an example of some of the innovative um, and entrepreneurial things that we've been seeing happening both on a global scale and within um, Australia. And some of this I think is really um, gorgeous, like um, in the area of ecology and say, um, you know, uh, fauna management. We've seen some great crowdsourced initiatives like Ko Koala Tracker, um, where people who live in koala 
regions where there are koalas can actually download an app and, and monitor koalas and that feeds a national database and gives us great information about um, uh, you know where koalas are and you know whether their habitats whether their numbers are growing or declining in habitats um, and friends of mine here in Bathurst because there is a koala corridor they've actually got some money to plant a whole bundle of trees from the government to create a corridor for koalas to move along uh, and that's as a result of some of the uh, national data that's being gathered around koalas and their areas. Um, and of course the other one I don't know how many of you might have been involved in that I was involved in it this year was the um, Aussie bird backyard bird count and that happens every year where people download the app and they just spend an hour in their backyard and then they uh, record or any of the birds that they've seen. And so you can see that 3,381,768 birds were counted in 2019 as a result of that Aussie Backyard Bird Tracker, which again is a great way of, um, you know, crowdfund, crowdsourcing uh, labour and knowledge and data and input and getting some uh, wonderful out, out outcomes um, at a very low cost. Um, I think these are going to be really vital post bushfire so if people can get involved in any of these initiatives and um, help out with this sort of thing that would be fantastic. Uh, the other things I think that are really interesting on the side of innovation and entrepreneurship are new areas like um, peer-to-peer -peer loans, um, obviously the collaborative economy, so um, things like Airbnb, but not just Airbnb, um, there's things like tool share, yard share, so in places, um, I'm not sure if it ha happens in Sydney, but I know in places like UK and major cities in Canada, um, if you've got a backyard that you're not using, somebody can actually come and, you know, plant uh, vegetables in it or something and then you can get a share of the crops um, because you're giving your land for nothing um, and then there's tool shares because you know if you buy a drill you probably use it for 10 minutes um, once a year or twice a year so um, uh, there's whole places in major cities where you can go along and just hire a, or share a, a tool. So there's all sorts of share economy type things, which are ways of trying to improve and, you know, uh, reduce consumption, share resources, and of course, things like Airtasker, photo and image sharing, Spacer, um, which is about office sharing, all of those are, are, are great new initiatives and new ways of doing business as well. And I'm just wondering how many people have heard about Flow Hive. That was a real big thing a couple of years ago. Um, my parents used to keep bees and I actually have been involved in trying to extract honey from um, uh, the frames that go in the beehive. So basically you have to get this frame out and then you have to um, uh, take the wax off the top layer of the uh, honeycomb. And then we had a centrifugal um, sort of drum where we spun out the honey. And so the process was quite labor intensive. And this flow hive, um, actually you just have to turn a knob and the honey flows straight from the hive into a jar. And they um, promoted this as a new innovation online using social media and using crowdfunding um, uh, sites and using video because obviously video is a great way to sort of like promote your social media, oh, sorry, your crowdfunding activity. And in six weeks, they raised a record breaking $16.9 million. And so far they've sold 51,000 hives to over 130 countries. And this is just a backyard uh, operation. So, or it was when it started. So I think um, these are great examples. And of course, most recently we've seen the crowdfunding for the bushfires and how absolutely astounding um, Celeste Barber's um, crowdfunding campaign has been with over $51 million raised so far. Um, so there are some great examples. And what, so I think the question was, um, Guy, did other people have other examples? Were yeah, we gonna ask have. that? There have been a few. Uh, I'll just launch a poll asking whether you have been involved in a crowdfunded or crowdsourced yep. business initiative, and that's yes, no, or unsure. Uh, people have been talking about Facebook groups they're a part of, for example, a, a buy nothing slash give Facebook site for the West End in Brisbane. Oh, um, great. Yep. Uh, people are really excited about Flow Hive. It was Flow Hive, was it? Yeah, Flow Hive. Mm. Yeah, like amazing. <laughs> 
Uh, most people haven't yet sort of been involved in those sorts of things. 70% no, and about 28, okay. 29% yes. There's also, I think you can do online volunteering as well. And there's all sorts of stuff. Um, so I think these are great ways that, you know, um, people can get involved in great new initiatives. But from a, I suppose, if we go back to the manager leader aspect, it's, um, I think some, just looking at maybe simple, elegant ways that you can actually improve uh, outcomes in your organisation. I love uh, Google uh, what do you call it, Google Forms, because for I've got always on feedback on any of my courses where students at any time can just jump anonymously onto these Google Forms and give feedback on the course. So I think that that's really useful. Um, and I always check it and, you know, promote it sort of a couple of times a year. So that's just one little initiative that I've introduced as well to try and sort of um, use technology to improve our practice. And we'll do that in this short course as well. Yeah. Um, in, interesting point from Paul in the chat. Yep. Um, flow hype is incredible, but often real, like real uh, beekeepers talk about the health of bees uh, and and the ability of you know the old style hives to teach about bees. So I guess in any sort of change, there's going to be the risks associated with it and downsides and all those sorts of things. Um, yeah. I suppose we'll be talking more about that in future weeks. Yep. Okay. Yep. Cool. Okay. All right. Um. All right, so obviously another great big change, which is part of disruption, um, great big challenge, sorry, which is part of uh, disruption is uh, artificial intelligence. And so, um, fortunately, Skynet hasn't taken over. I can't remember when, what the date of that in the movie was, but um, I know that November last year was um, uh, the date that we we're all supposed to be uh, mixing with replicants, but um, uh, yeah. So, so I'm sure that's going to pop in the chat. Yeah, it's interesting to see, isn't it? That um, I love looking looking back on those old movies and then looking forward. But anyway, um, so advanced robotic, obviously machine learning and artificial intelligence are revolutionising business and. And, you know, intelligent robots can learn, adapt and anticipate and respond in real time much faster than humans can without the downtime and the error rates. And, you know, uh, most of the audience will probably know that um, the thing about um, uh, self-driving cars is actually they're much less likely to have people, you know, they're much more reliable than humans because humans are much more likely to make mistakes than, um, than the self-driving cars. Of course, there's always little anecdotes, like um, people have told me anecdotes about how self-driving cars weren't programmed for for, you know, they were programmed to avoid things like cows on the road, you know, things that walk on four legs, not things that bounce like kangaroos. Um, but, you know, all you have to do is then, you know, uh, once that is learnt um, and can be programmed and adjusted, then the, the, the self-driving AIs can adapt and adjust. So um, the reality is that these systems don't need to be perfect. They just need to be better than humans. Um, and it, it, it is already occurring in areas like agriculture, agriculture, manufacturing, mining. I mean, self-driving um, vehicles in mining is huge, the use of them. Um, but there's other areas like healthcare, education, banking and infrastructure where AI is um, really huge. And there's a number of reports and in the, um, I think in the study module guides, I've put a link to a McKinsey and Company report that touches on the opportunities being delivered for AI, by AI for businesses today. And um, I think um, that's really a very useful read um, if people are interested in having a look at it. Um, but I thought this um, particular slide was interesting because it just shows one industry and the enormous amount of um, AI activity that's already occurring in the healthcare sector. So telehealth, and I'll tell you, being in Bathurst in a regional centre, um, I am really looking forward to telehealth. Um, on Monday, I had to drive 50 kilometres to Orange to meet a specialist for five minutes to t for that person to tell me that my results were clear. So I drove an hour, 50 k's, had five minutes with them, 
and drove an hour back. I really, telehealth is something that I think, particularly for regional Australians, is just something that can't come soon enough. Um, <laughs> and I just get angry that it's such a protected system, the medical industry, but you know, I can't be told that over the phone. Um, good news they, at least. <laughs> sorry? Good news at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely good <laughs> news. Good, I was happy it was good news, um, but I was a bit cross about the time in, factor involved. Um, so telehealth, um, obviously in Australia, the big thing around my health records is that whole sort of like cloud-based storing of health stuff. I do understand huge ethical implications around that, but sometimes I also think it's quite uh, useful. Um, I have an older sibling who has a mental health issue and doesn't always disclose all things to doctors, which has actually resulted in um, him having uh, been prescribed medication that caused some significant damage. Um, so, you know, I think if ha having that information stored in a My Health record could have been quite useful in this case. But, you know, obviously there's lots of ethical differences. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, the data analytics, um, uh, so, um, you know, things like, I guess wearables are providing better information about patients to clinicians, better health data. Um, it does give, you know, more regular up-to-date information, can give better insights. Um, obviously medical imaging like MRIs are really, you know, any, any imaging analysis that's all um, improving. Um, and they can incorporate things like algorithms that enable radiologists to spot abnormalities quicker that are not necessarily visible to the human eye. Um, so, you know, obviously drug discovery is another big area where um, things can be um, utilised. So AI can aid scientists in identifying, you know, novel drugs or impacts of drugs and all sorts of things. Um, so, yeah, it's just an example of the amount of disruption and change that's happening in, in one industry alone. Okay, so I'm just going to move on to, now this is the last of our, oh, it's 8.23, I should hurry up, shouldn't I, Guy? Um, this is the last <laughs> of our great big uh, challenges, um, which is the one that's most, having the most significant impact in Australia at the moment. So it's... Um, sustainability, social impact. Um, and so I might actually move to the next slide because um, this is probably the better one. Um, so it, sustainability we can define as the integration of eco ecological, economic and social dimensions. And so the bushfires are the classic example of that. I mean, obviously it's got the human dimension of people being, you know, losing their home, losing their businesses, the horrendous um, thing that it's being faced, being faced. But ecologically, we're talking about one billion uh, animals uh, killed in the bushfires. Uh, but in terms of economics, the cost is enormous um, to the Australian economy in terms of lost business, uh, loss of tourists, um, a whole load of downturns, um, people not being able to get supplies, all sorts of flow on implications. So we're seeing this in Australia. Obviously, other parts of the world are facing similar uh, disasters, uh, not similar disasters, but uh, facing natural disasters, which are having uh, similar impacts in terms of uh, ecological, social and economic impacts. And that second image there is of the um, the roundabout at the Hotel Indonesia in Jakarta. And Jakarta is a massive city which has, you know, huge transport problems. And you can see that there's no transport on that roundabout apart from a couple of vehicles and um, and there's no transport down any of the streets and they're all completely flooded, flooded. And you can think about for an enormous city of probably, I think it's about 20 million people, um, the impact of those floods because they're flooding people's houses, they're flooding businesses um, and, you know, the, the loss of goods and, and the impact of that is enormous. So 
It is an enormous challenge for businesses. Um, and the other thing is people are changing their way that they do business. Um, people are making decisions on values. So consumers are increasingly value mo motivated and care more about issues like sustainability and social impact. Um, and also uh, employees care also more about the organisation and their values as well. So what we see in uh, for managers is number one, recruiting people, but number two, make sh making sure that you've got customers or stakeholders or um, uh, clients or whatever, um, servicing them and, and ensuring that you're actually being able to deliver. And I suppose if you're in um, government social services sector, you're grappling with a huge issue at the moment. Um, tourism sector, you're grappling with uh, a huge downturn, retail, all of those areas. Um, so um, sustainability is a big issue and it's not only about the roles of business, government and management. Um, However, the role of management is the focus of this subject. So more than ever, businesses are being judged by their customers, employees, society and investors. And post bushfires, I actually got in touch with my super firm, uh, super company and said, I want to just invest in sustainable investments. So here's a personal action that I took because I just think it's so important. Um, so businesses do need to focus on human sustainability, cultural diversity, values-based e action, ecological sustainability, and they need to put in place the proactive leadership and strategies and, and build a culture within an organisation that cares about this because this is going to be a driver for the future. Um, and just in terms of Australia, um, a three degree um, change in temperature, which is what's being predicted, even if we do nothing, if we, if we stop all emissions, apparently, if you believe in climate change, and obviously I do, um, the prediction is the world will still continue to warm for another, uh, for another few years and it will warm up another 1.5 um, degrees Celsius. But another three degrees, much ha harsher fire weather, more severe droughts, more intense rainfall, um, sea level rise, destruction of the Barrier Reef, uh, the uh, Great Barrier Reef, large increase in species extinction and s ecosystem degradation. So we're seeing problems with food production. Um, so it's going to be a tough continent, Australia, to survive on, let alone thrive in, if we don't do anything. So I think um, this challenge is an enormous challenge for manager leaders in um, the VUCA world. Um, and so just because uh, it's 8.29, I'll just go back to this one. And this is a interesting slide because it just shows you the rise of social entrepreneurship. And what we're seeing is a big rise, particularly amongst millennials in um, what we call uh, businesses with a cause. And so these are some of the examples that I've kind of gathered um, in the uh, popular media. Um, so, um, being conscious of the time, um, maybe we just quickly run to any questions or comments, um, Guy? Yeah. yeah, there's quite a few questions and comments. Um, I'm happy to run a little bit long, you know, it's the first week um, mm -hmm. and it's a free course. So if anyone needs to, to head off, that's totally fine. Um, if you're happy to hang around, Catherine. Yeah, I'll hang around. Probably. Yeah, great. Okay, well, there's a few. Um, a couple about the fifth industrial revolution. They're sort of asking how will it be determined and, and what is it and those sorts of things. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and that, I that's don't the know. point, right? We, we don't know yet. <laughs> I'm going to have a look at that fifth industrial yeah. Re revolution. Yeah, and, and, and is, are they sort of, you know, defined revolutions? You know, the third flows into the fourth sort of thing? Um, I guess it's just about framing what's happening. Um, so people look to sort of like explain different phenomena. Um, so STEAM is obviously something that was in common with developments that happened around that time. Um, so you had the industrial revolution where people came off the land and into the, uh, into the factories. And so you saw sort of a move away from art, the artisan economy into the more sort of like um, manufacturing economy. And then 
uh, then you had Fordism and the, um, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the breaking down of production into component parts, so the assembly line, and that really sped up the speed with which uh, goods could be produced. And so, you know, the whole sort of like change of industry around that, so instead of, um, within manufacturing, one person making a whole garment or a, whole, or, or a team making a whole car, you had people just putting on the wheel um, or just sewing the collar. Um, and so that then, that assembly line is something that framed the way people do business. And then obviously technology came along and it framed the way people did business um, so that we could use computers and connection and, and do business in a different way. Um, so, and now obviously we've got AI and robotics and all of those things and it's framing the way we do business. I don't know what's going to frame the way that we do business in the future, is it? Um, you know, global you know issues and disaster management i don't know um yeah i don't know i guess that, yeah there's a whole heap of maybe answers to mm. questions for example there's a couple here about malicious actors and how vuca will will handle those whether it's a state actor or or you know oh people, yeah. yeah like like putin i've been <laughs> yeah. listening to an excellent de uh, podcast on abc one as um uh, Russia, if you're listening, and it's just phenomenal the amount of interference that Russia's having in um, Australia, in the UK, in the US, it's just, and, and in Europe, um, in the EU. Um, so amazing. Yes, malicious actors, it's, it's yes, um, that's a whole phenomenon that how do we deal with and what is the future? Who knows? Yeah. And, and, and thank you. I, I like to think, hackers. I like to think the humane. <laughs> side of the world will prevail um yeah cyber hackers yeah i mean it'd be good to use some of them to bring down putin wouldn't it but <laughs> <laughs> yeah crowdsource that everyone that, that's, that's but the takeaway the moral, from the course. but the moral thing is we can't do that because we can't condone it that action mm -hmm. you know it's that whole sort of you know history's written by the victors sort of thing isn't it yeah okay uh We've got a course related question. Can I ask Kath which is better? Which is better? We'll maybe wait for that one for next week. Mm -hmm. um, or I can answer it by email or something. Yeah, yeah. You've got all of our details on the course page. So, so just chuck something across and, and we'll get to it. Um, also, probably a good time to say if any of the questions we don't get to or, or unable to, to fully work through tonight, you can chuck it on the forums in the course page. They're a great way to sort of continue the, the discussion after, uh, after the webinar finishes. Um, interesting question from Jonathan, um, again, talking about, you know, the fourth industrial revolution, uh, a company is now built to last or built to be sold. And then I guess that goes again to the question of, you know, what humanity and what the point is. And but I think that's always happened though, Jonathan. So, um, you know, it all, has always happened and we've seen lots of examples of that. So, um, uh, James Squire beer, I think, is that an example where that was bought by one of the major, so in, say, the alcohol industry, um, if a small um, brewery comes up and has a lot of success, then often it's acquired by a bigger um, brewery um, and then their products are brought into their portfolio um, you know I gave the example of my uncle in the butcher situation where you know now it's in the supermarket a lot of that sort of stuff so inevitably those sort of things always happen and yes you will see um, businesses being created and then sold um, and maybe that's good and bad. I mean, it can be good because the person who created them doesn't have the finances to actually expand it and, you know, um, deliver it to a wider customer base and the product is really innovative or the service is really innovative and it's beneficial for a larger organisation to take it on. Um, and then that person can then go and invent the next level thing or just retire on their huge income. Um, but, you know, I do also understand that it can be um, quite uh, um, challenging and sometimes uh, disappointing and sometimes the vision is lost and and it doesn't go to plan so yeah um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Uh, final question maybe for now and then we'll, we'll talk about what's coming next week um, so thanks everyone for sending in what you have 
Um, it's a question from Brian, and, and I was perhaps a little bit flippant in just sort of saying, uh, just a throwaway line before. But he's asking, and, and given this is the intro one uh, on VUCA, in, intro session on VUCA, he's asked, what's the difference between bushfires and my house burning down from a birthday cake? And I just sort of said, you know, it depends on how chaotic your household is. But he's sort of saying <laughs> that, the, that the process is, is you know, maybe the same or, or that you could look at it in a similar fashion. Yeah, okay. I think that, um, so, I mean, putting aside the birthday cake, so it's an accidental fire, but, you know, it could be the chip uh, fryer, it could be the, you know, birthday cake, or it could be something. I think insurance companies have knowledge and processes around um, sort of insurance claims that are sort of business as usual. Um, but bushfires are acts of God, I suppose, if you, you know, how are they classified by insurance companies, the scale of it, um, you know, uh, some of the anecdotes that I've heard is that if your, fire, if your house is completely burnt down, then it's easier to claim than if it's partially burnt down because that's more complex. Um, I guess... In reality, it's not that much difference, except that your house burning down, hopefully is just your house burning down and it's not your whole community being wiped out by you starting that fire in your house and, um, you know, cutting roads and access and electricity and uh, water and all of the things that have happened to some communities. Um, so, so that's what makes it, and also, um, the fuel in your house, I suppose, is contained within the walls and wind doesn't come into it. Um, whereas in external, you've got wind, you've got all sorts of weather, you've got the bushfires creating their own weather pattern. Um, you've got um, all types, different types of fuel. Um, so you've got much more variables. So I think it's much more complex than your house. Thank you. Is that... <laughs> Yeah. Taking yeah. a serious slant on a flippant question. Yeah, yeah, yep. um, yeah, and then, and then you know, again, something you can you can debate all week in the in the forums. Mm -hmm. um, so, what are we chatting about next week? Yes, yeah, so next week we'll look at leadership and what sort of leadership we think, or I think, or theorists thinks think that is useful and uh, important for a um, to really uh, manage effectively in the VUCA environment. Awesome. Look forward to it. Um, thank you, Hannah and Chantel from IT Masters for coming along. Thanks all of you lovely folk who, who listened along and to everyone listening to the recording later on. And Kath, thanks so much. I'll let you sign off for tonight and, and, and speak with you next week. Thank you very much, Guy, for your support and your, the team. Um, and thanks everyone for coming along. I'm amazed to have so many people at this session. All right, bye-bye.